Right, good afternoon, members. I hope everyone can hear me. I can see quite a few place, faces on uh, on the screen. Um, it's been a uh, this is a very unusual sort of situation we find ourselves in, and uh, I notice it's almost five months since the uh, six months since the uh, the last meeting. So, uh, as I say, this is the uh, the new normal. Um, so, if we can just move into the uh, the agenda. Uh, Tracy, Cedrant and apologies. Thank you, Chairman. We've got 15 members currently present, um, three physically present in the room being the Chairman, Councillor McKee and Councillor Stitt. Other members are participating via Teams. And we have Councillor Campbell, who is substituting today for Councillor Young. Apologies that are noted are from Councillor Young, um, Timothy Birrell, Sam Scobie and Rose Surtees. Thanks, Tracy. Now I uh, approve the, uh, the remote participation. So can we move on to uh, declarations of interest? Do we have any declarations of interest? No. Okay. So... So do we need to start from the beginning again? Almost. <laughs> Apologies for that, members. I've been told that uh, you couldn't hear anything at home, so we'll go back to the beginning in that case. Um, so, uh, as I was saying, um, obviously this is a very different way of uh, holding meetings from what we've been doing uh, prior to the COVID uh, lockdown, and hopefully we won't have any more uh, problems uh, at the moment. So, can we go into the uh, sederant? Apologies and chairs approve the members' remote participation. Tracy. Thanks, Chair. Slightly updated from my previous um, sedent is 17 members present, three physically present here in the room, being the Chairman, Councillor McKee and Councillor Stitt. The other members are participating via Teams. I have apologies from um, Ross Surtees and uh, Councillor Murray, as well as uh, Timothy Birrell and Sam Scobie. We have substitute John Campbell, who is substituting for Councillor Young. Thanks, Tracy. Now I uh, give my approval for the members' remote participation. So, moving on to item two, declarations of interest. Do you have any declarations of interest? I see some shaking heads, and I can't see anybody uh, offering the, uh, the fact that they do, so we'll assume that there are none. So if we go on to item three, the minutes of the previous meeting of the 17th of March 2020, if members can remember that far back, my memories are a bit hazy about anything we've been in the fair of March, so can we approve those uh, minutes? Okay. And if we move on to item four, the update on the reopening of schools, verbal update, director of skills, education and learning. Uh, because things are moving so rapidly, I thought it would be useful for Julian to give a verbal update rather than a written update. Just before she does, can I uh, just say a few words? Uh, I mean, this has been a, <laughs> quite an amazing year, really, when you think about it, for everyone, but I think especially in terms of uh, education, the way in which things have uh, changed over the last few months. Uh, you'll remember that all of the schools closed with very short notice on the, uh, the 20th of March. And then uh, we had to set up remote learning, establish uh, the learning hubs for uh, key workers and uh, other youngsters. We then had to move to uh, the remote learning. The question about whether the exams would be held or not, um, that was quite uh, stressful, I think, for a lot of the, uh, the youngsters, having worked so hard 
um, in order to get to the position where they were ready to sit their exams. It was then decided that the exam diet would be cancelled um, and the results would be based on their school assessments. We then had the uh, planned uh, return to uh, blended learning to schools on the uh, 12th of August, or the week beginning the 12th of August. That was then superseded a few days later by the proposal to, remove, to uh, return to full-time learning uh, at the same time. So having done all the planning for the, uh, the blended learning, uh, that then became the, uh, the fallback position if the full-time return was said uh, interrupted for any reason. We also had the SQA results uh, with moderation as per the algorithm to take into account the uh, past performance of schools, which was then overridden by the uh, um, overridden by the return uh, purely on the basis of um, the assessment. So uh, we had the return of schools without face masks on the, uh, uh, the week being the 12th of August and then subsequently we had the uh, uh, change with the introduction of face masks in public areas. So there's been a huge amount of changes and um, um, alterations throughout this period and I think it's a testament to members of staff within the education and learning, skills education and learning directorate, but not only within them, but without the, uh, the council as a whole, and also to the, uh, the parents who've been involved with uh, homeschooling. I think that's been a delight for an awful lot of parents, and the uh, great relief that that's come to an end. And, uh, um, and particularly to the pupils who've had to put with a huge amount of uh, disruption at a crucial stage in their lives. I'd just like to pay testament both on behalf of the uh, um, the committee itself and for the administration, I'm sure I speak to all members of the council. Just to thank you very much for all your uh, efforts. Thank you. So I'll pass you over to Julian. Thank you very much, Chair, and good afternoon, members. As Chair has highlighted, the schools across Dumfries and Galloway opened to all pupils on the 12th of August, and over the last four weeks or more, we've seen a smooth return to learning and teaching. Like all businesses and services, we're not back to normal. And we know this may take many months, but we see pupils back in classes, staff working with learners and supporting our children and families. So we've adapted to new routines. We thank all our parents, carers, pupils and staff for their support and understanding as we've worked through some of this learning. We have got new personal hygiene practices, enhanced cleaning arrangements, arrangements for face coverings. We've given specific advice for school transport and school meals. These, and with complying with the physical distancing guidance for staff, has meant that we've had to adapt to new working practices across all our schools. Every school building is different, the settings and context are different, so we've had to work through what this means for pupils and staff at an individual teacher and class level. For some of our pupils, this planning has been at an individual pupil plan level, and some staff have specific risk assessment arrangements too. There's been a prioritisation of cleaning and facilities support, school meals and school transport. But through the commitment of everyone to get the schools back open, we're very pleased with what we've achieved. Schools are now working with targeted support to children using our recovery curriculum, what we reported to members over the summer, specifically literacy ladders and developing number knowledge. For older children, we're working through the practicalities of consortium arrangements and college programmes. Given the current restrictions on movement of pupils, we're emphasising the importance of digital. We're building on the investment from members for the Bring Your Own Device programme in all of our secondary schools. As the Chair highlighted, the position with SQA has been monitored over the summer. The adaptations around syllabus for this current session is currently being consulted on nationally, and we await details of what the exam diet and actual course requirements will be. We're working closely with colleagues in the National Virtual School and across the South West Education Collaborative developing our local virtual resources, which we know will support our schools, should there be a requirement for any local lockdown, as well as young people who are unable to attend school for a range of reasons. We know, having asked them, that a very small number of our pupils and their families have worries about or out with school, and we have our plans of support through the wellbeing resources that we've promoted to all staff. We have counsellors in schools, and our educational psychology service is leading on positive mental health. Now we know that as the numbers of cases across Scotland rise, we have to be vigilant and we've got good connections with our public health colleagues to give the best advice to pupils, families and staff and to complying with our test and protect arrangements. 
Within our schools, we have COVID-19 management plans, which have been developed and tested in conjunction with our local resilience partners. So we know we can respond efficiently and effectively where and when required. Ensuring that our schools are safe for all our staff and pupils has been our priority. We want staff, pupils and parents to have complete confidence knowing we have put arrangements in place to make sure that we keep people safe. We will continue to review these arrangements to ensure that they are continuing to deliver safe environments for all within our safe communities. The Support DG website has all the information parents have asked for and this is kept live. So I'm happy to take any questions. We've got a number of papers today at committee chair, but I'm happy to take questions specifically on the recovery arrangements. Members, any questions? John Campbell. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It was actually, you moved on a bit quick when you were on the uh, agenda item number three. I'd uh, put up to speak by the time I, was, uh, I typed in speak, you'd uh, moved on to agenda item four. It was just really just for a bit of clarification uh, in the, the, the previous education committee meeting in March, uh, agenda item 13, it says uh, in paragraph 13.3 that uh, there was going to be uh, more information brought back in May. I'm just wondering, has that information been brought back? It's uh, to do with the Dumfries Learning Town uh, update. I'm just wondering if that has been brought back to a, you know, full council or, you know, uh, a, a, the ad hoc committee uh, in the past. That's all. I think there's a report due to come to the uh, November meeting about that, John. Okay. Yeah, happy with that, Chair. Thank you. Richard Brody. Uh, thanks, Chair. It's been a massive operation getting our schools back uh, to learning again, so that's congratulations to the department that things seem to be going well. Uh, just a question on the cleaning. The, I've had concerns that, that uh, some schools have... have there have obviously been a lot more cleaning and there have been more surfaces like desks to clean on a regular basis. But there seems to be a case where th this has uh, led to less cleaning of floors and other things led to other problems. Just want assurance that you've got enough capacity in our, in our cleaning staff. Julian. Thank you, Chair. Yes, the, the cleaning has been an absolute priority for us. And we know that there were some issues right at the beginning just regarding the scale of what we were trying to do and through our solution centre the team have been absolutely fantastic in supporting schools and responding to individual concerns so yes there has been some quick changes um, and these have been communicated directly through the joint trade union groups so Yes, it, it is a new form of service. We have prioritised it. It has been difficult in some cases to have e enough staff doing everything that everybody would want them to do. But we have a shared ambition to make sure that everyone feels confident about coming back to schools. So it, it may not yet be as all teachers and head teachers would wish, but we're working closely with the joint trade unions and with the Solutions Centre to make sure we re respond quickly to any concerns that are raised. Thanks, Julian. I don't see any more questions. Unless I Thanks. missed something. Um, as I said before, a lot of this has been, or all of it's about uh, partnership uh, working. And um, Mel McGill, who's the uh, the chair of the Dumfries and Galloway Parent Council Forum, sent Julian and I an email um, earlier this week, which I said uh, I would actually read out just to make sure the uh, the gremlins didn't get in the way and uh, uh, we didn't get this uh, recorded. So uh, the uh, email reads as follows. Dear Jeff and Gillian, ahead of Tuesday's Education and Learning Committee, I'd just like to share thanks on behalf of parents in D&G for getting our young people back into school as safely as possible and to praise the Central Communications team for clear, consistent messages for parents throughout lockdown and the holidays. I do recognise there are still issues in some schools regarding transport and additional support for learners, but I am confident everything within the authority's gift and within the Scottish Government guidance has been done to resolve these as quickly as possible. I'm mindful that it is sometimes difficult to contribute on to online meetings, so I'd be grateful you could perhaps uh, mention this message at some point. So I hope I, I did your message justice, Mel. Okay. 
So before we move into the, uh, the rest of the agenda, I propose that we have a, a short uh, video from the uh, Parent Inclusion Network, which when I saw today I thought was really good and uh, very appropriate. So could you play the video? I hope everybody uh, enjoyed that. I thought it was um, an excellent video. Um, <laughs> so Gillian will be sending a copy of um, her presentation out to uh, all members of the committee and all the elected members after the, uh, the meeting, and also an update on the uh, SQA results as well. Okay, so if we move on to... Uh, Agenda item five, early learning and childcare, reopening of early learning and childcare from August 2020. The report provides an update on national and local developments on the reopening of early learning and childcare services from August 2020, and progress with the expansion programme to provide 1140 hours of funded ELC for all three and four year olds and eligible two year olds. The report details the impact of national guidance on the reopening of uh, services and the impact of interruptions to capital works on the local delivery of funded early learning and childcare. The report also outlines the national guidance in relation to funding follows the child and the national standard, including the extension of improvement periods and the additional financial services support available to ELC providers. The report seeks members' agreement to receive a final report on the completion of the 1140 hours strategic project in November 2020 
And just while we're on the subject, I think it's worth uh, noting that there was a question to the First Minister at uh, FMQs on Wednesday, and it turns out that uh, Dumfries and Galloway is one of uh, only 11 local authorities who are actually uh, um, launching the 1140 hours on time. So I think that's, uh, once again, tribute to the amount of effort our staff have put into uh, developing this programme over many years. So we have um, Rose, is it? to uh, speak to this. So, Rose, is anything you want to add to your uh, paper? Um, yes, thank you. Um, just for a brief update to the paper, um, since August... Oh, you have my microphone's on? Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me? Um, so, just as an update to the paper, um, the children that are in receipt of uh, funded early learning and childcare at the moment, um, 55% of them are already taking up the full offer of 1140 hours and 91% taking over 600 hours um, of funded early learning and childcare. Um, also further to the paper, Calside Nursery is now open. It opened on the 24th of August and 23 children have already enrolled for this session to take up their funded placements at Calside. There are um, just a few outstanding um, building works still to do at um, Spring Home, Lorry Now, Cannonby and the full refurbishment at Calside, um, but we are um, able to deliver 11.40 across the region to our families. Thanks, Rosie. So, members, any questions? All right. Jim McComb. Thank you, Chair. I'm looking at page 18, 4.4 and 4.6. Is there a change of emphasis highlighted there with regard to children attending more than one setting? Rosie? Yes, orig the original guidance which came out um, just before prior to the summer break, um, stipulated that there, there sh should be limited uh, blended placements um, so that children should only really ideally attend one service. Um, however, where there was critical childcare, for example, for key worker children, then these places could go ahead. Since then, the further guidance that was published at the end of July um, slightly changed the emphasis in that more um, it was felt that the um, public health guidance had, had supported um, the use of more blended placements and it was more the emphasis was then placed around parental need so it encompassed more more families and we do have 177 families at the moment who are taking a blended placement but fundamentally, because it's a public health issue, where, where they can, families should um, try to limit the number of settings and ideally, um, if, they, if they're able to, just use one provider, then that is what we're recommending. Thank you. So the, the current guidance should not make it necessary for parents to give up employment. No, absolutely not. The, cur the current guidance supports the use of blended um, placements so that parents are able to go to work or training should they need to. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. Okay. Am I missing it? No. In that case, I've got no one else wanting to uh, speak, so can we move to the, uh, the recommendations on page 17? Can we note 2.1, 2.2, 2.3? 2.4, and can we agree 2.5 to receive a final report on the completion of the 1140 hours strategic project in November 2020? Agreed. Thank you, members. So moving on to uh, agenda item 6 on page 23. This is the uh, Properties, Buildings, Schools Asset Class Update. The report provides members with an update on the end of year outturned financial position for the 2019-20 across both the schools asset class and the 1140 hours project. It also details the financial capital allocations as set by members of the ad hoc COVID-19 subcommittee, 
specific, specifically the funding available for the current and future years up to 2022-23. The report also highlights the top-level reprofiling anticipated due to the impact of COVID-19 on project delivery, together with the projects on site that have been impacted. And we have uh, Lauren Foss to speak to this. Lauren, is there anything you want to add to your report? Thanks, Chair. Um, just, just to highlight the fact that there's obviously quite a, a substantial amount of money that's looking to be reprofiled, um, the £2.92 million. Pounds. Obviously, we're still in quite a, a fluid position where um, we, we're still anticipating movement in that value due to the um, social distancing that needs to be uh, in place for contractors and workmen um, and workwomen on sites, and also actually the supply of materials through the delivery chains. So um, that, that number will... As I say, see a little bit of movement. Um, however, that will go through Finance, Procurement and Transformation Committee on the 6th of October. So at that point, we'll have a, a fixed number that will be carried forward, um, and then it will be the usual uh, carry forward um, anticipated after that point. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, members? Um, John Campbell? Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm just looking at the uh, capital investments on page 29 for the uh, 1140 hours. There's a bit at the bottom there that says capital grants to private providers uh, of 686,490. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering if Lauren might have a bit more information. If not, I mean, I'm quite happy to take this, you know, out with the meeting. But uh, just, just to see if, uh, you know, some of this money was helping out, uh, you know, for preparations because of the, the COVID pandemic. But if he hasn't got that information, I'm quite happy to take it out of the meeting, Chair. Sorry. Um, just, just to confirm that, that money was actually allocated um, to increase capacity at um, partner provider settings. So that was, that was allocated pre-COVID. Um, so there's a, a number of locations, um, Kids Ahoy, Calderbank, um, Max Play 1 and 2, that, that, that were um, fortunate enough to be provided with the capital support to increase their physical capacity. So, so this um, ha hasn't had any um, additionality to partners due to the COVID pandemic. There are, however, um, other funding mechanisms that will support partner providers to, to be able to uh, up, up the level of resource um, to, to account for different staffing ratios and um, supply of, of, of product to, to support with the, the um, sanitisation, uh, etc. Thanks very much, Lauren. Thanks, Chair. Jim Demister, not being parochial, I trust. Uh, oh, you wouldn't dream of it, Chair, no. I wouldn't dream of it. Uh, on 3.3.5, I, I get exactly what Lara and Shane and why that's being done on page 25. On page 24, 3.3, .3, I get the reprofiling and, and understand fully about that as well. I think it's a bit of a shame, though, that half of the reprofiled budget and came out of my ward alone. And I'm just looking for a reassurance from Lara and that uh, if it remains that way, this will be prioritised next year and we won't find a further bounce because... Uh, I understand exactly what's being done, but there has to be a fairness and equity about this. And I uh, just look for a reassurance that it will be top of the list next year if it's not completed this year. Lauren? Uh, I, I, absolutely. Um, all, all that's happening really is the ability to actually be on site to do construction work has been delayed. So there's no change to the output of the projects. That they remain exactly the same as they are. Um, so it, what, 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 is, what we're seeing is around a 30% increase in the time scales to deliver the projects uh, as I say just mostly down to social distancing at this point but also because we had a, a handful of months where there was no one on site so the projects in terms of output remain exactly the same thanks for that chair thanks Lauren. okay jim i don't think there are any other members wanting to speak no so can we move to the uh, recommendations on uh, page 23 can we note 2.1 2.2 2.3 and 2.4. Okay, thank you. So moving on to uh, agenda item seven, the director's end of year assessment, 1st of April 2019 to 31st of March 2020, of education and learning business plan 2019 to uh, 23 performance. The report highlights the overall progress being made across a wide range of indicators and projects within the business plan. 
Support in this report is the detailed annual education report and improvement plan update, which provides a narrative around progress being made in the national improvement priorities, as well as highlighting the key successes over the past year. And we have Julian to speak. We have, we have Sheila to speak. Sorry, Sheila, I didn't see you there. Is there anything you want to add to your report? Um, just that, that I think it is about drawing the attention to the annual education report because I think that gives you a flavour of the work that has been carried out over the past session. But indeed, it, it stretches beyond um, this um, end of year assessment because it does cover some of the work that has been ongoing up until till August because it's an August to August report. Members? No. George. George Jimson. George? I, I would just like to make reference and congratulations really on the, the senior phase, the looking at alternative approaches to qualifications such as work-based learning and, and such like. What I would like to ask of you is, do we have the resources in terms of career advice to make senior pupils and indeed people in third year of the opportunities of skilled based courses, NPAs? Um, we'll have a land based employability course where, where young people can go out and get, get, get experience within industry. From my own anecdotal experience and the hands on experience, I'm quite heavily involved with that in, in, in my, my job. Is it possible that there's not enough? time or resource in schools given the, the, the breadth and depth that teachers have to follow. Do we have enough resources to give parents and young people enough information on all the alternative courses that, they could, that could be available to them? We have, as you know, um, over the past year been taking a particular focus on our senior phase strategy. Um, and now, having got that embedded and beginning to see the work and the, the impact of that, what we're now doing is switching our focus to the, the early stages of, of the BGE and indeed the um, into, into primary schools. Because what we're wanting to do is to make sure that there, there is that progressive pathway that is suitable and meets the needs of all our young people. We've got an education officer, so officer that is specifically looking at work-related learning now. Um, and we have just um, entered into a new um, format of, of work-related work learning, which will, we hope, open up a lot more opportunities, um, uh, skills-based learning that will take account of the needs of a much wider group of youngsters. In fact, all, I would hope all of our youngsters. We're also doing a review of the S3 experience at the moment. Um, and will be challenging our schools to look at their curriculum to make sure that they are effectively meeting the needs. I think as we take a closer look at um, our um, exam results, but equally um, this year, this coming year, where we will not have performance results that are exam based, we maybe need to be taking a closer look at what's actually um, to our young people, what's their ex point of exit looking like, What's their portfolio of qualifications looking like? So we are taking a closer look at that now, but we we want we could only do it in a stage process. So having got the senior phase embedded, we now wanted to look um, the route to the senior phase. Okay, George. George, you're muted. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, that Sheila. I'm really impressed with, with the progress that's been made and the ambition. It's, it's really good. The, the, the only co other comment that I would make is it's, it's quite important, in my view, not to define skills and academic as separate. There's a real good crossover because what we fi find potentially is that the academic route is given a little bit more credibility than, than the, the, vo the vocational. Uh, and I'm, I'm really keen that they're, they're taken in the same as the same worth going forward because it tends to stereotype young people far too early. We will be bringing to to committee at some point in the coming session a recognising positive achievement um, statement and policy, which will I, I hope reassure you that we are recognising all qualifications. That's people. excellent. Right, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, John Campbell. 
Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, I was looking at the exception reports uh, in Appendix 2. You know, some of them are actually quite worrying, you know, around the uh, looked after children and those that are in the SIMD areas. And just on the back of that, in the, uh, the annual report, I was looking at the pupil equity funding. Uh, the amount of money that's uh, you know been spent in various areas, and although there's there's some good examples you know through this particular report you know where where they have made uh, a difference to some children, uh, I'm just wondering you know if, if if we're spending that amount of money in certain areas, i.e. you know for teaching staff, non-teaching staff, uh, IT equipment, software, and all that, are we actually uh, you know, getting a handle of any sort of measure, uh, and and do we do a review so that we say, well, this particular area is not working, and you know, can we change that? Or, you know, uh, I, I'm kind of worried that we're spending a lot of money in areas that might not be, you know, providing the results. Especially when you look at the exception reports, it's it's it, it doesn't sort of uh, bear fruit, you know, to to the PEF funding, but. Uh, uh, I'll be happy to hear uh, uh, any explanation, please. Sheila? Yep. Um, so the PEF, PEF is, is, um, is allocated, as you know, to schools. And um, it's the, the, the plan, the PEF plan that um, is taken forward with the school is entirely at um, the head teacher's, um, uh, you know, he, he, he or she can judge how it's to be spent. What we need to do and, and have been doing over the past session is increasing the level of scrutiny and challenge around PEF. Um, absolutely agree with you that we're not seeing the impact that we would want to see in some um, uh, areas of intervention. And the question is to the schools, if it's not working, why are you still doing it? Now, obviously, some of them will take time for the interventions that they're working through, but we we do need to see greater impact of, of PEF. A considerable amount of money comes to the to the local authority, and we want to make sure that it's having the absolute greatest impact. My concern, and I I I am uh, happy to, to to state this, is that um, I feel that it it needs to be we're, we're we need to be investing in interventions that are going to make um, a sustainable difference to the young people and their families. And the, the increased flexibility of our use of PEF over this coming session, I hope we'll see a greater impact. But we have a, a programme of, of interventions now that we challenge the school to be considering as part of that, because this doesn't make good reading some of these inter these exception reports, and we do have to to improve improve these outcomes. Um, some of the work that Gillian mentioned in her um, initial report about the literacy ladders and the developing number knowledge are two interventions that we have um, developed um, locally, which will be key to some of the, the closing the gap work that we need to do. Um, West schools moving forward. Okay, John. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just trying to work out where we are on the list. Is it Jim McComb? Jim McComb? Thanks, Chair. I'm looking at page 152, the table on that page. and numeracy. There are yep. several commendable improvements shown in the table, but I am puzzled by the decrease in primary one to primary four in literacy, writing, and in numeracy. Could you shed any light at all, Sheila? On yes, and, and that 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 is that's that's a concern that's been drawn to our attention because actually, what we're seeing is that the, the stage between P P one and P four, we start to see a drop um, in um, attainment um, during that time. 
So what we're, we're asking schools to do is to take a closer look at the planning for learning and the interventions that are actually being, taking place at that time. We're working with our primary schools um, to develop um, or bring them on board with a four stages model of, of progress and achievement, which will allow us to be able to monitor more closely where the youngsters are in moving towards achievement of the appropriate level as they get to, to primary four. I don't, I, 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 we need to work out where, where this drop is happening. Is it primary three? Is it primary four? But there is definitely a decrease at that stage. And we, several years ago, we noticed that at primary seven, and we've, we, we've, that's been turned around. We need to concentrate now on looking at what's actually happening in that P1 to P4 stage. Thank you. You're obviously aware there is an issue there. Yeah. And you're taking action to identify the causes and hopefully remedy the situation. Yes, yeah, because I think I think that chart's particularly interesting because when we look at at at, at our, our year on year results, we're not comparing um, one year against the, the next, but this one we're actually being able to measure the increases in, in attainment that we're seeing over time. We're, we're, we're following the year group here rather than in, in some of the other charts. It is a very useful table. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. I think a major concern is what the effect of the, uh, the COVID-19 and the, the long shutdown will have on attainment generally and certainly in terms of the, uh, the attainment gap. You know, uh, So I think it's something which will need to be monitored very, very closely right across uh, not only our school estate, but all school estates. Would you like to say anything on that basis, uh, Sheila? Yes, and I think that is something that we do need to, to be taking a, a very careful um, uh, look at over the coming um, session. At the moment, we, as you as you know, no, no attainment data was gathered um, for um, BGE um, this this in, in June this year. So we haven't got th th that sort of um, authority-wide data um, uh, to, to, to sort of take that closer look at at this moment in time. So what we're doing currently is we're making sure that officers are visiting each school or at least um, making contact with each school to discuss that att what attainment's looking like and what how the youngsters are um, coping with being back into school. What I think we'll probably do, and I need to discuss this wider with the head teachers, but I think we would want to be taking a look at what progress is beginning to look like in November. Um, because that will, through the normal monitoring and tracking processes that are happening in schools, to start to get a picture of, of what, what are you, how our youngsters are actually coping. Um, but where there are particular youngsters that we've been working with, in relation to interventions and, and, and making sure that that gap does not get wider is that that focus of work has already started and we're seeing assessments happening in schools that are allowing schools to benchmark where youngsters are. Thanks, Sheila. That's uh, very reassuring. Okay, so I've got no one else looking to speak. So, oh, oh. Yeah, I'm time in here of forgetting that looked after children, are they children that's in council care or does that cover uh, foster and adoption as well? I just, just want clarity on how we have look, looked after children for 10. Sheila? So we've got looked after children are, are looked after children in, in care or, or at home. Linda, I don't know, Linda's on the call. I don't know if she wants to come in to talk about the looked after and some of the work that we're doing around um, looked after children at the moment. I'm happy Linda. to do that, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, just to clarify, the looked after term means that they're on a legal order and that can be at home in, uh, in council provision, residential provision, or with foster carers. It's the, the, the legal order that makes them looked after and care experienced is those young people who have previously been on a legal order no matter where they were living. Um, so if you like I can tell you a little bit about the, the lack of education if that's helpful at this point. Um, 
you will have seen the, the exception reports and so on. We're still continuing. We've still got a lot of progress to make uh, with looked after children. We have got in place our multi-agency looked after raising attainment team uh, with social work, health and newly joined to that is Skills Development Scotland because we were aware from the data that the positive destinations from the 18-19 data had um, decreased markedly and so we brought SDS on board and we're looking at um, focused multi-agency work in the coming year, particularly around S3. Alongside that, we're ensuring that we're, we have the right data that we know where these young people are. We've highlighted some issues with young people who are looked after before they started school and we haven't been able to include them in our system before because we didn't have that information. But also we need to ensure that schools are updating their systems um, after S1 when young people join. If a young person becomes looked after after that time, we need to ensure we have the up-to-date information so SDS are able to access these young people. So as a key piece of work we're doing just now, we're still looking at the exclusions. We have managed to reduce the lack of exclusions and that was pre-lockdown. Clearly we didn't have a, any during lockdown. Um, we do have a target of zero exclusions for looked after young people. Um, we're still some way to achieving that target, although it should be noted that 101 of our schools didn't exclude anybody that was looked after last year. So most of our schools, by <clears throat> far the largest percentage, are not excluding looked after young people. Um, part of our work around exclusion now is to target some schools that we've identified to support and challenge them uh, to um, try and achieve our target of zero. Uh, we're also looking at attendance. We've highlighted that lack at home uh, generally have poorer attendance. Uh, we know that this fits with a national trend, but we do know in Dufferin and Galloway we have more looked after at home young people than other authorities have. We have something like 35% of our looked after young people at home compared with about 25% in other authorities. So that's a particular issue for us. And one of the things that we're taking forward with social work is looking at how we're tracking that attendance through looked after reviews. So in looked after reviews is the standard health questions and so on about GPs and dentists and so on. Um, we're seeking that attendance will be, an attendance update and exclusions will be a part of every LAC review so that we're keeping a tighter hold on this and able to intervene at an earlier stage. Uh, on, on that note, in terms of look, children that are looked after at home, we know that one in five of those children have an attendance rate of less than 80%. So we class that as critically low attendance for looked after young people. Uh, critically low attendance is classed at 60% for uh, young people that aren't looked after, but we made the figure 80% for our looked after young people it's again so we can intervene early. The whole thing about the raising attainment, we need to ensure that these young people are in school um, <coughs> before we can even expect to see a rise in the actual attainment levels. Um, so we, we have this multi agency group, but we're also setting up an education group that um, will be supported by Education Scotland. So our LAC attainment advisor is going to be part of the group with us. And we're bringing together a group of uh, senior managers in schools to try and push forward a bit with our uh, LAC attainment agenda. Another development is that every action that we have on the LAC raising attainment plan, we're ensuring that we've got links to all other education groups so that we're not a standalone group trying to, to make these changes, we're embedding it in the whole system. Uh, and we report to the corporate parenting group, which feeds back to the children's services plan. Thanks, that was very useful. Uh, David? I bet that pair of losses wishing I hadn't answered that, asked that <laughs> question. That, that was, that was uh, very interesting. Would it be sensible to ask for a, a six monthly report on that? Because I never, I never realised it was such a wide range of youngsters. They're virtually everywhere. Do you think a six monthly or an annual report? Do, do you mean with reference to the looked after population? 
Yeah, so I just, just more or less what you said, keeping us up to date with what you've said and what improvements you're, you're managing to make and keeping children in school and all that sort of thing. Part of our, our process now is that we're um, producing a LAC data report every March and October. So we're due to um, gather all the data together again in October. We'll be a few months into our updated LAC reason attainment plan. So at any point after that, we would be happy to provide an update. The director's nodding, so uh, I think the answer is yes. So we'll put that as an additional recommendation that we receive a six monthly report. Julian? May I, Chair? It may be whether we would like that incorporated to the standard performance report or whether it could be a briefing sent just for information to all members. I'm happy to take your advice on that. Well, we could do both, could we? Put out a, um, a, a briefing to all members and incorporate it into the uh, update. Yep, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I've got no one else indicating they want to speak. So if we move to the recommendations on uh, page 35. I think we've uh, reviewed the uh, overall summary for the end of year performance, 2.1. 2.2, scrutinised the exception reporting. Uh, 2.3, we've reviewed the education annual report. 2.4, note the progress made within the annual education improvement plan and the um, update, the regular update on the looked after children as an additional recommendation. Okay. Members, so if we move to item... Eight on page 221, Education and Learning, Revenue Budget, Monitoring Report 2020-21 for the period ended 30th of June 2020. The report provides members with an overview of the key budget monitoring issues and the projected performance against budget for the current financial year for education and learning services based on the position as of 30th of June 2020. The report also includes in Appendix 4 an overview of the 2020-21 activity-based budget for the service. And we have uh, Colin Pentland to speak to this. Colin, is there anything you want to add to your uh, report? Um, nothing to add to the report, Chair, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Members? Julie, Julie Irvin. Thank you, Chair. It was just a question to do with bullet point 3.5 on page 222. Um, obviously, the Scottish Government announced um, additional funding due to COVID, and it was really just for some clarification around that. I was wondering if the expected funding came through in the quantity that was anticipated. Colin? Um, yes, re yes, regards to uh, 3.5, yeah, confirm the 1.424 initially allocated is definitely coming in. And last Friday, we received a formal letter advising that uh, 0.855 million is to be received as well, yes. Okay. Can I ask, following on from that then, obviously there was money top sliced for the first two weeks back in school. And I was wondering how much of that budget was actually used within that fortnight. Colin? Uh, so, in regards to um, the, the first two weeks of the 1.4 million, um, it was initially roughly allocated, 340,000 was allocated over that, that the initial restart. Um, we're currently working with the services just now, gathering information based on um, what the schools have provided to us. The, the, the teams are gathering that information just now and um, look at the timesheets that are going through to reconcile that back just to make sure we caught everything. Um, currently, as I said, we're indicating roughly about 340,000 at this time. However, we're just waiting to quantify that with information still being returned from the schools. And obviously, we'll provide members with a further update um, as part of the course on how we're spending the money and as it going forward. Right. Can I ask one further question? It was to do with the newly qualified teachers. Obviously, newly qualified teachers, there were some who were offered contracts during the summer, but those were rescinded. And I just wondered how many of those newly qualified teachers had access to employment through that additionality funding. 
Colin, is this an area for you? Um, possibly, possibly not. I'd maybe seek the service. Um, Gillian, would, would that be? Okay, Gillian. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we've certainly been communicating in detail with the EIS on this, and I'm sure we can be happy to continue those discussions. When the information and the initial ambition from the Deputy First Minister was given to the Scottish Government, to Parliament, there has been an interpretation of that over the summer. And I think we as a council have to ensure that we don't spend what we don't have. And therefore, I think it was important that we maximise the number of job opportunities for our newly qualified teachers. And we have absolutely done that with the support of members. And if there are any newly qualified staff that don't have contracts, we have been working closely with them. But it is a balance to strike between giving everyone a job with a budget line that we don't yet have and making sure we make the best possible use of the money that we are allocated by government. Thank you, Julie. Thank, Thank you, Julie. Okay. okay, so I've got no one else indicating. Just check with Tracy. No. In that case, can we move the recommendations on page 221? Can we note 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, and 2.7. Okay, everybody happy? So if we move on to uh, item 9 on page 251, the John Wallace Trust Scheme 1981 applications for sessions 2019-20. This report sets out the basis that grants are paid in respect of the academic year 2019-20 and asks members to approve uh, eight new student applications for supplementary bursaries for the duration of their course. It sets out the travel allocations for schools and makes recommendations for the rate of provisional travel grants for 2020-21. And uh, the author is Susan. Susan Martin, is there anything you want to add to your report, Susan? So I'll, I'll take that one, Chair, right. if I may. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Normally this report is um, presented to members in May. Clearly we couldn't do that, but I've already given any students assurances that following members' decision today, any payments will be made timiously because we're aware that students will be starting their university and college courses in the coming days. Thanks, Julian. Uh, Jim Dempster? Hey, thanks, Chair. I have no issue with the travel grants being paid. I do think, though, that the report is lacking information. In the past, we would always get a list of the pupils that were going on to further education, where they came from, and what courses they were attending. And I don't think this should be the subject of a, a, a redacted information. If for some reason it is, I would still want to see which schools are sending what number of pupils to make sure that, because it's quite possible that one school, there are only two, there's only Sankt Academy and Wallace Hall, one school could be sending 24 pupils and the others are simply no, for some reason, it being able to share or encourage kids to apply for this fund. So I'd want to know where the pupils came from. And I do think as elected members, we should be getting the details of the pupils. It's no, a uh, I don't think privileged or, or, or information needs to be kept away from members. It might come as a as a, a, a reserve bit of information rather than a public document, but I still think elected like members should get that information. Julian. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Councillor Dempster. I know that we've worked on this one for some time and that we've worked through whether it should be an exempt paper or, or not. I don't think anybody would want to make public the names of pupils and the courses that they were attending, and I know that that's not your intention either. But I can absolutely share with you where the students have come from. From the eight new applications this year, we have four from the schools and four from the college. And from those eight pupils, we have one, well, from the, the four from a school, we have one from Sankar and three from Wallace Hall. And from the four that are going, uh, coming from a college background, we have two from Sankar Academy Catchment and two from Wallace Hall Academy Catchment. 
I'm absolutely happy to work with you and with governance as to what level of information would satisfy everyone. I think having an exempt paper in the past has caused some questions because we do want to promote the the fact that the trust exists and bringing it to committee in a public forum is one good way to do that, but we clearly don't want to identify the pupils. So if with perhaps further advice from the, the chair and governance, but I, I think a straightforward addition to the report next year could be a percentage of which school catchments these candidates came from to make sure that Sankar and Wallace Hall are both advertising and promoting the trust equally. Yeah, I'd be quite happy with that, Jim. Uh, yeah. hey, thanks, Chair. Well, I am I'm most happy with the information and advice Gillian gives me. I think the point I would make is there are 300 pupils attending, or 360 attending in Sankar Academy, and there are some similar going to Wallace Hall. So from the qualifying area, there are 700 pupils, and there's only four new applicants or eight new applicants. I don't think that's the right proportion for the kids that will be going into further education. That always gives me concern, and Gillian and I have spent a, a lot of time trying to work out how we might improve on that. So I'll probably take it up with Gillian online, but as far as the information concerned, I, a, 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 a percentage might help in, in future. Thanks, Chair. And Gillian indicates she's quite happy to, uh, to speak to you online. Next time I'm in Sankar, Councillor Dempster, I'll make sure I get them, uh, get, get it well promoted. Thanks, Gillian. Okay, I've got no one else indicating they want to speak, so can we move to the recommendations on page 251? Can we agree 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, and 2.4? And I've got no urgent business, further business, so thanks for your attendance, virtually or in person, and we'll see you uh, beginning of November, I think. Thank you. Right. Bye. Well then, cheer. Cheers, everybody. Thanks, yeah.